session will commence and with that uh, we'll start with the um, call to order and roll call senator higdon senator kerr senator mills senator parrott senator schroeder senator smith senator westerfield senator wilson senator yates representative blanton here representative bratcher here representative dossett representative duplicy representative freeland representative fugit here representative gentry here representative gooch here representative hart here representative cook here representative lewis here representative maddox representative massey here representative mccool here representative mentor here representative sharp present Representative Stevenson. Representative Tackett Lafferty. Here. Representative Wesley. Here. Representative Wheatley. Uh, Co chair Thomas. Present. Co chair Meredith. Present. So, no, we do have a quorum. Uh, if you would, please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing, and uh, Representative Wesley will do our invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you today, God, for your goodness and mercy that you've shown upon us, Lord. And God, we ask you, Lord, to just give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to direct this uh, committee, Lord, and the decisions we need to make for the best of the Commonwealth. I thank for our leadership of Senator Meredith and Representative Thomas. Lord, I ask you to let your hand be upon them and, and lead them and guide them for the best of our military and our veterans and public protectors. And I thank you and I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Uh, you have the minutes of the October meeting. I uh, hope you've had a chance to review those. If you have, I uh, would entertain a motion to uh, approve those. Right. Motion to second. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposition? Minutes are approved. We do not have a uh, distinguished veteran to recognize today, but in lieu of that, I'd like to take a moment to uh, uh, recognize a few folks. I'll start on the Senate side and uh, Hate to cast dispersion on my Senate colleagues, but uh, honestly, we've got a, uh, a dearth of um, representation uh, from uh, the Senate this morning. But nevertheless, I want to recognize Senator Kerr and Senator Schroeder and Senator Parrott for their contributions to this committee and to our legislature. And want to wish them, wish them the best going forward. And uh, on the House side, I will uh, turn the gavel over to Representative Thomas, Co-Chair Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. We do actually have uh, three out of four of our retiring guests there. And uh, one will be here. Well, I say that, but he'll be here at 1030. He said he got hung up in traffic. So maybe at the very end, I can recognize him again or so. Uh, but uh, uh, we do have a couple ones leaving. We have uh, Ed Massey, Representative Ed Massey. We're uh, sorry you're leaving. You've been a big, big help here and, and we appreciate everything. Would you like to say say a few things or? I'm just taking an involuntary sabbatical, um, <laughs> but I won't be gone for long and, and uh, I'll be around in some capacity. So I will see all of you uh, somewhere, one way or the other. Great. And then uh, Representative Mentor, Patty Mentor, uh, she's been with us since 19. I think you and Ed came in the same same time and and I think you might be taking that same, uh, <laughs> same hiatus there. So would you like to say anything? Oh, thank you, Chair Thomas, for giving me this opportunity. I'd like to express how much I've enjoyed serving with all of you, not just in this body, but in the uh, VMAP committee in particular. And I'm very happy that I have been able to see to groundbreaking the uh, Bowling Green Veterans Center. So again, now this is a good example of watching policy come to life and soon we'll be doing a rip cutting so again, thank you all for your support of that project, and I'll certainly be around. 
We have two other members uh, that are not with us this morning. Uh, Buddy Wheatley came in with that same group in 2019. He's going to be missed. He's been a big advocate for veterans and, and uh, the fire, firefighters, obviously. Uh, so we're sure going to miss Buddy. And then Jim Duplessy, he's been around since 2015. And uh, I think he, he texted me. He's stuck in traffic, so he'll be here a little later on. So uh, maybe we can give him a sec there. So I'll defer back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks everyone for their service. And I guess I was a little premature in my remarks uh, regarding my Senate colleagues, and I should have known Senator Kerr wanted to make a, an, uh, an entrance. And uh, Senator Kerr, uh, I wanted to recognize your service on this committee to our legislature over the years, and you've got a long storied career, one I'm sure you're, you're proud of, and we're certainly proud of you, but uh, appreciate the, all that you've given to uh, this committee, to our legislature, and to our Commonwealth, but certainly give you an opportunity to say any remarks if you would like. Well, again, I'm just amazed that all the best looking people in the legislature <laughs> serve on this committee. It's just ironic. What are the chances? It has been uh, the honor of my life to serve. I think this may be my next to the last committee meeting out of uh, serving here for 24 years. That's almost a quarter of a century. And I have been I have loved every day of this. Now, I haven't liked every day, but I have loved the opportunity, and uh, it has been such a blessing for me to know so many people. You know, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle we are on or what how we differ with our own party on certain issues. At the end of the day, everyone who makes the decision to come to Frankfurt and serve in this capacity truly are good people and truly want to do the best for this beautiful state. So thank you for being my friends always and Godspeed to each of you in the days to come. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kerr, for your, your words, your wisdom, and your contributions. If we could just take a moment, let's recognize all these folks. Representative Tackett Lafferty, did you wish to be recognized? Yes, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I just wanted to mention today, following the prayer and with this recognition, I felt like it was appropriate. Um, as many of you know, we had a, a, fata a fatal shooting um, involving three of our officers and a canine in Floyd County over the summer. And just this week, one of our young officers, Officer Lawson, has had to have his leg amputated from below the knee. So I would just ask that uh, people in this committee, uh, we recognize uh, his commitment to our community and um, keep him and his family and our community and your thoughts and prayers, please. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Thank you very much for that. Representative Blanton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, just wanted to briefly uh, bring everybody up to date. Uh, most of you are aware of Monday um, in my uh, county, we had a tragic uh, school bus accident, uh, 18 children on board, uh, plus the bus driver. Uh, most all those children have uh, that have been to the hospital have been released and sent home but we do still have five or six um, that are dealing with some very severe injuries some of them uh, will be um, uh, lifelong injuries that they're going to have to deal with um, one child is still on a ventilator um, and uh, a couple of them are still touch and go uh, at this point um, uh, and including uh, the bus driver herself who was thrown from the bus and pinned under the bus uh, when it came to final rest at the bottom of the embankment. Um, I, we appreciate all the prayers, uh, all the outpouring of support. Uh, the neighboring counties have been uh, tremendous in the response that day and in the response afterwards. Uh, surrounding counties all wore maroon. Um, the school colors there in McGoffin County um, so just want to update everyone on the, uh, the situation and ask that you continue to pray for these, these young men and women um, and their families as, as they uh, try to figure out how you go one day at a time through this process. So we're thankful that at, at this point there's no fatalities, but 
still tragic nonetheless. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. It certainly has been a challenging 12 months with the uh, tornadoes in uh, western Kentucky, the flooding in eastern Kentucky, the two situations you folks have mentioned. And if nothing else, it certainly is a reminder how precious life is and what a great gift it is. And we need to do our part to make sure, since we are blessed, that we become the very best people that we can be and continue to help others in need. But we certainly want to keep these folks in our thoughts and prayers. And thank you. Appreciate that. Moving on to our agenda, uh, next item is our Joint Executive Council Veterans Organization, and we'd ask um, Colonel Larry Arnett if he would step forward. Good to see you, sir. Always good to have you here. If you would, introduce yourself for the record and feel free to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Larry Arnett. Uh, today I speak to you on behalf of Chairman Bill Fletcher. Uh, who unfortunately uh, had an unscheduled uh, meeting out of state uh, today and was not able to, uh, to make the meeting. And also our 27 veteran service organizations who are members of the Joint Executive Council of Veteran Organizations of Kentucky, uh, JECFO for short. We have the, uh, the same mission as this committee and KDVA. Uh, we are charged with doing what is best for Kentucky veterans and their families. As JECVO, we try to speak with one voice, representing all 27 veteran service organizations on matters of interest uh, to our veterans and their families. So today, as uh, Mr. Chairman, since this is your all's last meeting for the year, uh, we want to take this opportunity to thank the members of both chambers for the significant and uh, some would say outstanding achievements that you have accomplished on behalf of Kentucky veterans and their families. I began working with this committee in both chambers in 1988 when I was appointed as the State Director of Veterans Affairs. Since that time, this committee, in concert with the administration, and the veteran service organizations have achieved remarkable successes in supporting your constituents, those veterans, and their families. It's easy to, to just tick some of them off. We have the, a, a, a strong and well-funded department uh, here in the state of Kentucky that you authorized, uh, which gives focus on policy and operational issues that deal with veterans. While I was serving as, uh, as Veterans Affairs Director, you authorized the payment of a Vietnam veterans bonus uh, to, to recognize and honor the veterans and of, those, the, of those wars. What we have achieved together in building, constructing, operating, staffing, uh, five veteran nursing homes, five veteran centers, is astounding. When you add to that five state veteran cemeteries to make sure that we give our veterans a final resting place of honor, when you add to that the Veterans Trust Fund that you authorized, which, author which allows us to spend money, raise and spend money that for projects and, and, and causes that uh, you can't normally fund through the general fund. Those are all major issues. And when you add those to a myriad of other major accomplishments that you have achieved from both chambers, it's significant. And on behalf of those 27 veteran service organizations, uh, we, we thank you very much. The nice thing about it is you haven't stopped. Last session, you made great strides in addressing the nursing shortage issue that we have in our Kentucky Veteran Centers. Uh, you beefed up the staffing of our state veteran cemeteries because they were having difficulties. You provided a strong and operational budget for KDVA While I'll be honest enough to express some disappointment uh, that the chambers did not reauthorize the 
tax exemption for properties owned by the veteran service organizations. We do recognize and appreciate all of the work that went into getting that tax exemption accomplished in the 21st, uh, 2021 session. Now, we have to be honest that we join probably a hundred other organizations in seeking your time and attention in this upcoming session. We have, uh, while there's no particular bills that have been identified as of yet, we do have a few issues that we would like to have the General Assembly consider in this upcoming session. First one is veteran suicide prevention. Last session, you took a step uh, in endorsing and passing a resolution urging our U.S. congressional delegation to urge uh, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs to add hyperbaric oxygen therapy at our two major veteran hospitals, Lexington and Louisville, HBOT for short, uh, and also allowing that to be given to, if, if not there, allowing it to, uh, to be provided to veterans here in the state of Kentucky uh, by, by uh, private contract services. It has been proven in research that HBOT therapy can reduce suicides in mild traumatic brain injury uh, issues. And what we would ask that if there are opportunities in this upcoming session uh, where you can expand on any effort to reduce suicide uh, within our veteran population, we would ask that you do that. We also encourage you to, to build on the success from the last session. Uh, we haven't solved, and I say we as a, as a group, we haven't solved the, the problem of staffing at our, at our veteran nursing centers. Uh, so we would ask that if there are opportunities uh, where you can enhance uh, the opportunity where we can continue to build those nursing staffs in those centers, we ask that you do that. The rooms are available. The only issue keeping our veterans from going into those homes are staff. And uh, so that's just an issue that we need to continue to, uh, to move forward on in every practical way possible. Lastly, we actually supported the intent of House Bill 608 uh, last session when it dealt with gray area uh, gaming machines. Uh, our veteran organizations primarily, uh, many of them primarily respond to the revenue that we get from our own charitable gaming issues. And some around the borders, more, more practically around the borders, where these gray area gaming machines have caused a problem and has reduced the revenue that we are getting in our veteran posts and therefore reducing the level of services that we can provide, we would ask if, uh, if that uh, issue comes up once again in, uh, in front of the General Assembly in this session, we ask that you give it its, uh, its due. Ladies and gentlemen of this committee, I look at our relationship uh, as kind of a, a three-legged stool. You have the General Assembly on one leg. We have the administration on the second leg, represented by normally KDVA. And you have the Joint Executive Council. You have all the, the veteran service organizations at the third leg. When we are working in sync and we are staying focused on those matters that are of importance to Kentucky veterans and their families, we are strong. The results prove it. Look at what you have accomplished. We have accomplished together. JECVO looks forward to working with you uh, in this upcoming session to move our matters forward. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity to, to speak with you this morning. Thank you, sir. Uh, great report as always. You know, I've only had the pleasure of serving on this committee for a couple of years, but long before I came here, I understood the commitment that uh, this committee, uh, both in the House and Senate, had made to our veterans and to our, uh, our, our soldiers and sailors, Air Force. And uh, that commitment being we want to be the most accommodating and friendly uh, veteran military state in these United States. And I think that's a goal that we're working towards. And I'm truly amazed at the, the commitment that everyone here is willing to make on behalf of, uh, of, of those people. And, and it is an honor and a privilege. I think we recognize, particularly uh, through this COVID uh, pandemic, uh, how valuable uh, veterans are to our workforce. And we've got to focus on, on accommodating those as much as possible. We certainly understand the importance of, of military members' families. And I think that really has taken a center stage over the last couple of years and needs to continue to. So I'm, I'm confident that we are united in what uh, we do. Um, I want to thank you for your years of service. You said 1998, and uh, you remind me of uh, the story about Farmer Brown. You know, he was known worldwide for how well he took care of his animals. You know, every morning he'd get up regardless of what the weather is and uh, would make sure his animals were taken care of. And one day, uh, Mr. Chicken said to Mr. Pig, he said, isn't Farmer Brown such a great person, takes such good care of us, we need to do something for him. And the pig said, well, Mr. Chicken, what do you got in mind? He said, how about a nice uh, hot egg and ham breakfast <laughs> to which uh, the pig said well you're making a, a, a contribution but i'm making a sacrifice <laughs> you mentioned that uh, uh, 1998 plus your military career you made a sacrifice uh, for this country and for the state and we appreciate that greatly thank, thank you very you. much mr chairman representative blanton thank you mr chairman uh, mr arnett thank you for your presence over here to your left um, thank you for your presentation today and, and for all the hard work you do. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, to, to point out, you talked about the shortage in our veterans nursing homes and uh, of staffing, and that's certainly a concern. And uh, I've did a lot of research and data. Uh, that's uh, something of personal interest to me. Um, and so I'm hoping that you all will join us um, and uh, uh, the commissioner would be uh, on board and looking at um, some of the facilities, and not only a shortage of, um, of staffing, but even prior to, we're not simply just not filling all the beds. Um, and um, we are at, I believe, about 37 beds left in our allotment in Kentucky, if I'm not mistaken. And so uh, the conversation between myself and some others have taken place that we look at and some of these uh, facilities around the states that are not able to staff nor to fill the beds, that we look at privatizing some of the rooms, going from two patients to one, um, and moving some beds back into the allotment so that we can uh, create a big enough allotment to uh, build another nursing home for us in Kentucky. Uh, and since 2017, I want to believe it was House Bill 13 maybe, when we uh, – did the language for the Bowling Green nursing home. Uh, that bill also included is the intent of the General Assembly that the next nursing home be built in McGoffin County. Mm -hmm. And so I want to, uh, and it has been included in every budget since that time, I want to uh, hope we would have your support in trying to privatize some of these rooms, uh, which I think could be beneficial uh, to, uh, to some of the uh, veterans staying there. Uh, and put some beds back in our allotment so we can move forward uh, in obtaining another nursing home uh, in the east. So uh, I just wanted to bring that out since you brought up about the veterans nursing homes. You bet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Norman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Blanton. Representative Sharp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sir, thank you for everything that you've done. And uh, I, my question is the uh, chambers you were just talking about, what's the cost on one of those? The, uh, normally it's around $12,000 per person to go through 40 dives in a HBOT chamber. Uh, it all depends on the significance and the seriousness that the individual veteran is having as to how many of those dives that we uh, that he that the doctor would recommend uh, that person to go through, but uh, about twelve thousand dollars per forty dives. 
What is the cost of the chamber itself, sir? It's a good question. I don't I don't have the actual cost of a uh, of a chamber itself. Uh, we are not currently uh, having that service available uh, at either of our VA uh, hospitals, uh, but where we have been having private is over in Winchester, uh, and uh, I'd have to check and see what the uh, what the actual cost of that machine is, Representative, and I'd be glad to get back in touch with you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Colonel Arnett, for your testimony this morning. I've enjoyed working with you the last couple of years. Uh, just for the sake of the committee, I want to know about the Veteran Service Organization and, and what's going on there. And Representative Bratcher and I are pretty familiar with that because we've carried it. One of us has been on that for the last four years as we work through that. Um, trying it different ways, constitutional amendments, looking at um, trying to carry it as a standalone bill. And the fact of the matter is that that will not go through as a standalone bill. We, we worked so much on that. We even got it into the budget language and had it go that way. And then it was in um, all the letters went out and they still end up paying it. So we've, we've tried about every workaround we can on that. The good news is that there is a pathway for these veteran service organizations to do that. Colonel Arnett, I think we've discussed this and all these organizations can do that. Um, they need to apply individually to do that. And yes, it is a little bit more work, uh, but there is indeed a pathway for them to do that. And then it's not for a lack of effort that we've tried to get that done. So thank you. And the veteran or service organizations are most appreciative to Representative Cook for leading the charge for us. Thank you very much. Good morning. That's all of our questions. Appreciate you being here this morning and appreciate your testimony. Thank you very much, Have Mr. Chairman. Day. Take care. Next on our agenda, Kentucky Department of Veterans Affairs, we certainly welcome Lieutenant Colonel Whitney Allen and his guest. If you would, please identify yourself for the record and feel free to proceed. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, good morning, honorable uh, members of the uh, committee. It's always a great honor to be here. Uh, my guest today, uh, Commissioner Whitney P. Allen, Jr., Lieutenant Colonel, Army, retired. Uh, to my right, this handsome man right here is my chief of staff, Dwayne Edwards. You met him in the previous committee. Uh, has been a, a great uh, asset for KDVA uh, and veterans in the state. Uh, to my left, this handsome man right here and this great warrior uh, is Dr. Silas Sessions. He is my new executive director for veteran services. He covers the areas of benefits, uh, cemeteries, uh, and state programs uh, in Iraqi and Afghanistan war veteran uh field artillery guy so he's been on the line been on the fight uh with our allies uh, and leading great men i've also had the privilege actually to serve with Bolton at different times he was the old man he was the old man and i was the young kid and by the time we served together, I was the old man. Mm -hmm. He was the young kid, and I decided to retire. In the back here, I have uh, James Hensley, Air Force veteran. He is my new public information officer. Uh, we call him Jimmy. So if one of us three is running out, ripping our suit, we're going off to save the world somewhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jimmy, take great pictures, please. Uh, as always, it's a great honor. Uh, I will be short. There's two major uh, administrative uh, issues I would like to take care of this legislative uh, session. But before I even go fur further than that, I'd like to do a couple of shout outs. For number one, I'd like to thank all of the communities that have housed uh, my veteran centers, uh, nursing homes, uh, my cemeteries, uh, and even the areas where my benefit representatives are located. Uh, for the great work, support, and love during Veterans Day or during Veterans Day week. Uh, for those, uh, you know, Wilmore, Hanson, Radcliffe, I can go on Williamstown. Uh, I, I appreciate all of the volunteers that went out and put flags at the cemetery at every grave. There's about 18,000 of them across the state. So families can come and uh, pay their respects uh, and see that we're honoring their legacies. Uh, I appreciate the uh, Veterans Day cards and the participation of, uh, at the Veteran Centers uh, for activities like the concert in Radcliffe or in Vine Grove where uh, many of our senior veterans, World War II veterans, Korean War veterans, Vietnam veterans were able to participate in, in, in uh, uh, parades uh, and, and other activities. So I'd like to thank everyone uh, for their effort and support. Uh, also, Representative uh, Ed Massey, uh, you've been a great ally. Uh, uh, you're not going to be missed because I'm going to try to steal one of your helmets as you're moving, but uh, I know you'll be back in, 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 in the swing of things, and then I know the committee as a whole have 
uh, been very gracious and supportive of KDVA operations. So I'll be really quick, be up, be brief, and be gone. Um, the two areas we're looking at, um, we, we are bringing, um, well, the first one is removing a residency or state residency from uh, the KRS governing our cemeteries. Last year, the committee passed uh, nearly unanimous uh, with what I'm saying, and then the House passed 96 nothing. So we want to bring this bill back, and hopefully that it goes through the House easily again and the Senate passed. Uh, the stakes are still the same. We do not remove the uh, state residency uh, from the KRS, uh, which originally originally in the first 10 years wasn't there. Uh, so uh, if, we, if we don't remove it, we lose millions and millions of dollars of uh, federal funding to expand our cemeteries. Um, we, are, we have current contract, I mean, um, correction, uh, grants going through. They will be impacted. Uh, you should have received in your packet uh, an information paper on it that also highlights the capacity of uh, all five uh, veteran centers. Most of them have only used one third of them, and or ask, we have cleared only one third. And as you can see, we haven't even gotten halfway through filling those those capacities. So um, I ask uh, this committee again to re uh, review this. We've uh, talked to several members. Uh, we found a sponsor of a bill, and it should be filed uh, at the start of the session. The second um, administrative action is uh, dealing with tuition waivers. There are some areas I'm looking at, but particularly the one uh, I like to, uh, 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 to change is the term of uh, completion of certificate. Um, uh, so how can I best explain it? A great example would be veteran becomes disabled, unable to work. His, his or her spouse decides that, okay, going from a homemaker to a new career, uh, wants to be a nurse, but starts off because of an immediate job uh, and be a NASA or a nurse assistant. She goes on and do training. She completes a degree uh, or completes a certificate. She cannot get the remaining or he cannot get the remaining months of training because by then they realize the money is there in nursing, an area that we know we're very short of. So um, I would like to pull that away and relieve the burden of the uh, uh, veteran spouse and uh, um, kids uh, or dependents uh, of worrying about uh, completing that degree and have their full 45 months of uh, eligibility. And it also uh, relieved the burden of the school to try to continue to track that. We do not want to lose anyone uh, in the system. Uh, and that's all I have right now. Um, as always, I support any bill uh, that is uh, accommodating and supporting for all veterans. Uh, I will put out that if you, any of you or any of your colleagues in the House or uh, uh, moving a veterans bill, uh, please talk to me, call my staff uh, so we can f uh, talk about it a little bit and see if there's a need for a bill or what could be better or what's there. Uh, several of you have called, uh, Senator Meredith, uh, for example, have talked and, and we laid out and this, well, we have these different systems in place. There's no, no need for a bill. Other than that, um, thank you uh, for all what you guys do in support of veterans and their families in the Commonwealth. Thank you, sir. Would like uh, for the committee's uh, benefit a little clarification about the cemetery issue because you and I have talked about this. Mm -hmm. If this occurs and, and should occur, uh, it's just not the, an open border, so to speak, on anybody can be buried in our veteran cemetery. There has to be a Kentucky connection of some sort. Is that correct? That, that That's the current, but the residency is here. Uh, the National Cemetery Administration uh, has put out uh, policy that all states remove residency and shouldn't deny uh, internment of any U.S. veteran, U.S. citizen uh, buried in our cemeteries. That is the, the, the latest guidance. Uh, right now with uh, the residency and connections, uh, and at one time when they added this, as I did my homework, uh, it was no change. It was concern about overflow, but when they changed, it was no change in, in operational flow. So somebody in Pennsylvania is not going to say, I want to die and be buried in the, in, in the uh, Commonwealth of Kentucky, unless they have a connection with uh, Kentucky, they left their kids behind after they moved on in service, uh, or, uh, or some other connections. But the most important about this bill and removal of it is the impact of federal dollars. That will hurt the economy because, you know, we use local businesses to expand the cemeteries, to put in the plots and barriers that are in there. So um, um, I estimated about 20 to 25 million. Uh, it could be more than that as we do it over time. So um, hopefully that answers your question, sir. Senator Yates, you have a question? Mm -hmm. 
Just to follow up on that, have other states removed the residency requirement? Yes, uh, there's less than 10, well, between 10 and 13 left to include Kentucky, and that number is dwindling down now. Any other questions? Representative Tag Lafferty, excuse me. <clears throat> Um, I have a question. Um, I've met with a few of my, we have a great uh, DAV service in our, uh, in my community, and they've brought something to my attention, and I'm not sure if it's something that we would uh, attempt to file a bill over, if it's something administratively, but it's something that, that I, I didn't recognize, and I don't think a lot of people realize, that um, when our DAV and our other departments go to uh, attend funerals and things such as play taps at a military funeral, something to that effect. Um, they've brought to my attention that there is only a maximum of a $60 fee that can be provided during that time for these. Uh, you know, I think our DAV said that it, it just at one of our uh, departments, they have at least six people attend almost every funeral. And and one of the gentlemen, he, he, he attends my church, and he's the fellow who plays taps on the trumpet and 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 um, so it's a service that's greatly appreciated not only in our community but across the common is that something that we would look to you know obviously with the price of gas and things of that nature right now you know it's important to encourage uh, you know uh, give them uh, an incentive to make sure that they they continue these services that are so valued it would that be something that we would try to change um, through uh, legislation, or is that something administratively that, that would need to be brought to the attention of, of the department? Well, let's talk a little bit more about it, ma'am, and, and analysis first and what ne needs to be done. Uh, it will be a budget issue, mm -hmm. and um, we try our best to follow the state and federal regulation uh, for travel. Uh, and I am blessed to say that we're, we're a generous state in that piece, but I do understand those concerns. But uh, please, uh, I can have um, uh, Al Duncan and myself or Al Duncan and Dr. Session come in and we can talk a little bit before we create legislation. That's why I mentioned okay. earlier, before we create bills, it might be administrative, it might be a budget issue, it might be legislation, so. Okay. Thank well, you. Thank you, I'll be happy to follow up. Yes, ma'am. Representative Duplessy, you have a question, a comment, sir? Yes, sir, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm from Hardin County, uh, District 25, and so I'm really proud and um, of the Radcliffe Veterans Center. It's 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 near and dear to my heart. It's an amazing, amazing home, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a home. It's not a facility. It's a home. It's, it's a love, sir. Sue it, Poppy it, and the team down there, they're awesome. It's, it's truly an amazing thing. Anybody who's not seen it needs to go see it. Mm -hmm. um, but I am very disappointed on how on the occupancy rate. And you mentioned quickly that. That there's going to be some legislation that you you're going to have looked at this next session. Um, I think I heard you say that. Well, uh, for the cemeteries and tuition waivers, sir. Oh, just uh, for cemeteries. Yes. So, well, so all what, all veterans. Uh, the neat thing about this uh, the great process of Kentucky, we get a chance to see bills come across and, and analyze and give our input. Uh, but for right now, it's those two two areas. Okay. So my mm -hmm. understanding is the the issue with with the veteran center and probably all the veteran center is that. Is, is workers it's not that there isn't available folks who want to come move in it's just that we don't have the workers because maybe the state or the pay rate is not high enough to main, attract and maintain can you speak to that oh yeah definitely sir what well, the biggest problem uh, and challenge is a, a nationwide shortage of, of nurses uh, and healthcare care uh, professionals so uh, I think we're uh, as I talked to um, Martha Workman our uh, Vice Executive Director for Veteran Centers. Uh, uh, the nation is 250,000 uh, uh, nurses shot across the country. So that's one challenge. Uh, two, uh, I'm working with the personnel cabinet for uh, um, addressing pay pay as, as, as a team, as we always does. And we've looked at different methods of, uh, of uh, making sure that uh, we, we try to match the compensation um, uh, for our nurses. But you have to look at the area. Fort Knox is right across the street. Federal jobs are, are, are really high paying jobs. Um, we're looking at um, um, uh, the private sector. They would throw money at a particular time. But the most important thing about uh, the population of the centers versus the workers is, and which keeps us our five-star rating, is the ratio of healthcare workers, 
nurses, uh, specialists, ancillary positions per um, resident. And we do not want to, to go over that. In the private sector, they will do the min minimum. We try to match. I, I think it's three to one. I could be wrong, but it is, it is so many workers to that one person uh, to provide the coverage that's needed. We need to have somebody there when there's a cold blue for that veteran dying. We need somebody there uh, to watch that door to make sure the uh, veterans that uh, was once strong minds or not strong minds and walk out there. So that's what it is. Proportion of workers uh, uh, is, uh, is online with the residency. So I, I guess just my parting thought, we need your input as to what this committee and this legislature can do because I, what is it, 50, 40 to 50 percent occupied in, in Radcliffe? It's it's a really low number. I don't remember the yes. last I heard. And yes, I, sir. It's As such a jewel that's getting unused, and I mm -hmm. know there's a lot of veterans who need that place. Yes, sir. It's, it's around the, the 37, 38 percent right now. Yeah. Uh, and um, and uh, we, we have emissions. So um, um, let me give me a second here um, so people would know. I always get that question. And as you can see, I have a lot of notes here. So, um, um, you know, uh, Radcliffe has admitted 13 residents in the last 16 months. So as we get more staffing, we add more people. Uh, when veterans pass, because um, they come there as their last, uh, to share their last moment with their family, they trust us with that. Um, we bring in new individuals. But please remember, and it is important to, to fill those homes, but we need to do it right and with quality care. Don't disagree. Just help us help you get that to 100%. Thank you. Yes, sir. I give the uh, last question or comment to Senator Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Commissioner. It's good to see you again. Yes, sir. Last time, of course, was groundbreaking for the Bowling Green yes, sir. nursing home. And uh, I wanted to go back to the cemetery um, and ask a question because I know it didn't make it out of the Senate. And that's something probably for a lack of understanding. And so just to clear up some things in regards to that, it looks like we have the capacity according to what we've been given here that we can expand. But is the stipulation from the federal government, if we don't remove that clause, they won't give us the money for expansion? Yes, sir. So currently, or are any we major getting major. any money for expansion? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How much sir. do we get? Uh, per it, year? it varies, sir. Uh, for, for, for grants, um, I think the uh, I don't want to misquote, but it was a couple of million dollars for West uh, and Central, I want to say, but I think West uh, down at Fort Campbell. Uh, uh, so it's a couple of million dollars to expand. You're putting in new crypts into the ground, double crypts uh, for those that mean single and double barrier uh, and then clearing woods and, and just setting up uh, a variety of things in those contracts. And we have two in the pipe that will cross that line uh, if uh, we don't change the residency, sir. Okay, so if we don't do that, then the expansion cost will be on us. Yes, sir. It will be on the state. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And um, how are our VSOs on this? It seemed like they were divided last time. I've heard a couple of things from the couple of organizations that I belong to. And so I was just curious, are, are you seeking their support? Always, or? sir. I uh, just talked to the uh, uh, Mr. Fletcher or Commander Fletcher for JECVO, uh, and we're always in constant discussions with uh, the VSOs. I understand some individuals are, are, are concerned, uh, and it's just about information. And we have the same information paper uh, and uh, other documents that you have right now has been pushed out. Uh, to all to Jack vote we've briefed him several times so those port contacts go back uh, after having my uh, state conference which I uh, appreciate uh, representative McCool and Pamela Stevenson representative Stevenson attending and, and showing that bipartisan and, and that joint uh, effort uh, talk to commanders uh, the state commanders about this so it, it, there is opinions about this but uh, everyone knows what's going on in the impact that so have. the 25 million that you mentioned that would be over a period of time that would be lost yes yes because we're always expanding the cemeteries we're always uh, putting in new uh column come back 
where you put ashes barrier sites, things of that nature. So right. it's commentary uh, barrier, common barrier. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah. So we're this is always a working project from here on out. The moment federal or the federal government says uh, we're no longer giving you grants, everything is one hundred percent Kentucky. Okay. Taxpayers. All right. Thank mm -hmm. you. Representative Cook, you have a, yeah, yes, a final Chairman. question. Comment. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm reading your two papers. Yeah. I'm a Marine, so easily confused here on paperwork. But as I'm mm -hmm. reading these, mm -hmm. I'm very confused because they both seem to say totally opposite of each other. Well, which page are you looking at, sir? Let's, so um, we've got, all right, so let's go to the one. If we go to the first one, pursuant to House Bill 331 on yep. the top. Um, okay. Okay. And then what's the second one, sir? And then your second one is subject removal of the word Kentucky from KRS 40.315. Yes, sir. Okay. So, so what's the confusion, sir? So on the on the um, back, if you go to page four on mm -hmm. the first page, mm -hmm. it says any action such as House Bill 331 that negatively impacts the quality and availability of the service must not be enacted. On, on page on the very back of it yeah I'm looking on page on page oh three I'm on page three page, uh, page four on the back okay I, no that is the question that somebody asked and we gave the answer to that okay, so that yes all right, so that okay, so that's what that is. That is yeah. a question and yes. answer there. And the, the, okay, and got it. That uh, was because sitting there, I'm reading that big line in bold, and I was like, "No, you just bring him back for Army guys. Remember we're working with Marines? Y'all great part of this, <laughs> but yeah, it's like, no man, here's the map right here. <laughs> I'm so, just reading big yeah. bold letters. So, so, so. the uh, the, uh, the the information paper or the executive sum summary uh, was written to answer every question that was either asked by the committee. A representative outside the committee and veterans. So my apologies. That's what what it is. And then okay. yeah, and I'm an officer, so I, you know me with maps. I was on page three. So uh, no, thank no you, problem. Sir. Well, mm -hmm. I I was just I was sitting here reading, and I was like, well, it says in Bowen here not to enact it, or we put her against it. So yeah, I'm trying yes. to clear that up. Thank you. No problem, sir. There be no uh, further questions, comments. Uh, I do appreciate the uh, the love and respect that's shown amongst our. Uh, um, various branches of the military and appreciate your multi-generational uh, uh, presentation this morning and, uh, and certainly your service to our country and look what? forward to working with you next session. Same here, sir. Thank you all. Take Have care. Have a blessed day. <laughs> our next agenda item, number eight, radon-induced lung cancer. I wish we could have a presentation day on maybe puppies, rainbows, and lollipops, but it doesn't look like it's going to be that way today. <laughs> you know, we're in a very unique situation. Uh, Kentucky's noted for a lot of things, but tragically, uh, we have one of the highest incident rates of radon in the nation. And I was asked for an explanation earlier and explained to me because of our extensive cave system. And I suggest I may be filling those in. And um, and that wasn't a good idea, but I was thinking about filling them with bourbon, which would make it more acceptable. But uh, with that, folks, if you would introduce yourself for the record and uh, feel free to proceed. Make sure your microphone uh, button is on. Should be a yellow light or green light, excuse me. I'm on. <clears throat> good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Kyle Hoyleman, Chair of the Kentucky Board of Radon Safety. Lindy Campbell, uh, lifelong Kentuckian, lung cancer survivor, radon-induced lung cancer. And I'm Shannon Baker, the Director of Advocacy for the American Lung Association in Kentucky. Pleasure having you here this morning, and I look forward to your presentation, so feel free to proceed. Very good. Uh, thank you, committee members, for this opportunity today uh, to take up an important public health challenge that we're working to overcome in our state. And that challenge is radon-induced lung cancer. Um, we do have a presentation. Uh, all three of us will speak, and we'll, we'll be brief in our comments. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Kyle Hoyle, and I'm the chair of the uh, newly formed Kentucky Board of Radon Safety. And the ladies with me today have uh, introduced themselves as well. <clears throat> uh, due to your work last session on House Bill 77, the um, 
Kentucky Board of Radon Safety was, was formed. Uh, that board is housed within the Department of Professional Licensing within the Public Protection Cabinet. Uh, the effective date uh, was July 14th of uh, this year, uh, and the committee has met numerous times to, to take up its work. Uh, I think we've met at this point three, three times. Uh, there are five voting members and two non-voting members uh, represented on, on the committee. Uh, the duties, as, as you can see here, are um, to promote the control of radon con in Kentucky, uh, among other things such as receiving and administering grants related to radon and ultimately promulgating regulations in uh, support of the statute. So why do we need a board of radon safety? Um, and uh, this, this chart sums it up. And uh, quite frankly, we do a lot of good things in Kentucky. Uh, we also struggle with some things uh, that we don't have control over, and that's Mother Nature and, and radon. Uh, you can see here that uh, radon is estimated uh, to, to um, uh, uh, basically for 1,000 of the 4,800 lung cancer incidents in our state each year. Uh, this is a report card that's put out through the Industry Association, and it is included with your material. Uh, you can see uh, that of those 1,033 um, uh, inc uh, incident rates, uh, that um, a lot of that is uh, because we need to take more effort and take more action in, in prevention. And uh, radon-induced lung cancer can be prevented. As far as radon policies in our state, uh, we do have a contractor certification program, and that certification program uh, recognizes EPA-recognized uh, proficiency programs and uh, uh, requires the use of ANSI standards for measurement mitigation and analytical laboratories. You can see uh, here on the bottom left, though, uh, that we don't have a lot of strategies to prevent uh, radon in, in our building uh, stock. And in fact, in some areas of Kentucky, more than 65% of buildings contain toxic levels of cancer-causing radioactive radon gas. We need to do a little better on, on the policy side. Uh, the graph that you see here, 44%, and this is CDC data, 44% of the buildings in Kentucky are estimated to contain action, uh, radon concentrations above the action level. So we, uh, when you look at the national number, it's around 15% estimated. Uh, it's actually 7% if you look at single-family housing within EPA. That 44% is, is uh, mostly single-family housing in our state. So we are um, many times greater than what the national average is as far as percentage of buildings containing radon uh, problems. And finally, I'll just point that there are um, public schools uh, in our state. Currently, the public schools are not required to build radon control systems in the schools. Um, so it becomes much more costly to address a uh, retrofit system after the fact uh, and much more economical uh, to build the controls in at, at the beginning of the process. As far as, uh, I'll leave you with some other information before I turn it over to Shannon. Uh, approximately every 25 minutes in our country, uh, radon-induced lung cancer does claim the life of another victim, and that's unfortunate because it is mostly preventable. Uh, in January of 2005, the U.S. Surgeon General issued a public health warning, similar to the smoking warning that we saw several decades ago. Uh, the Surgeon General warning is radon causes lung cancer. And in fact, radon is the leading cause of lung cancer among non-smokers and is second overall only to smoking. The medical cost burden of radon-induced lung cancer every year in our state is an estimated $210 million. And again, a lot of this is preventable. That doesn't take into account things like lost wages, impacts on families. Uh, that is the direct medical cost for the initial, the ongoing, and the last year of life treatment. Uh, so we have opportunities to ease the burden on our Medicaid and Medi Medicare system as well. Uh, we had some folks here today from uh, various branches of, of the military, uh, and I would point out that in 2020, and again, this information is in your pack, the uh, OIG for the Department of Defense uh, issued a, a uh, report that found members of our military and their families are at risk for radioactive cancer-causing gas on our privatized military uh, housing 
uh, campuses across the country. Uh, as a, a, um, a result of that in 2020, uh, the Defense Authorization Act does now require rate on testing mitigation in accordance with uh, the ANSI standard or the EPA recommended standard at all privatized military housing in, in our country. Uh, and that does include Fort Knox and Fort Campbell. <clears throat> the other thing that I'll point out is uh, our military installations. I mentioned schools. To the best of my knowledge, other than the voluntary work that's taken place in Fayette County with, with the uh, Fayette County Public Schools uh, and in Scott County with uh, some of the Georgetown schools, uh, only our military installations do require uh, proactive uh, radon or soil gas control systems be built into our, our school systems. Uh, and I'm aware uh, that uh, both uh, Fort Knox and Fort Campbell do have pretty advanced uh, programs uh, for uh, the, the actual military housing as well as the requirement for the privatized military housing. In 2021, HUD followed up with its own report through its OIG, and it found uh, the lack of a department-wide radon policy is, is posing a risk to building occupants. Uh, HUD map 20... <clears throat> HUD MAP, which is a multifamily housing program, the 232 program, we heard other folks uh, talk about residential or assisted, senior assisted living facilities. That's that program within HUD. And uh, I can tell you that now a department-wide rulemaking effort is ongoing within HUD uh, to develop a consistent policy for um, addressing radon in, in our uh, buildings. FHFA, the F Federal Housing Finance uh, Authority recently mandated that the GSEs, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, also adopt radon policy similar to HUD's for its multifamily buildings. And we anticipate seeing that policy roll out in uh, quarter one of, of 2023. So there's a lot of federal policy work going on. And what we need to do here in Kentucky is to take a look at what's happening with lending policy and take a look at what's happening with our schools, with our residential care facilities, with our um, other buildings, uh, including government buildings. I, I, I would uh, venture to say that we've done no testing in, uh, in this uh, annex that we sit in today, although I can tell you that uh, testing uh, over on the rotunda side did find elevated concentrations of radon here in, in uh, this government building complex. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Shannon Baker with the American Lung Association. Sorry for the musical chairs. I'm that person who likes to drive the car when I'm in it. So again, I'm Shannon Baker, Director of Advocacy for the American Lung Association. I appreciate the opportunity to be. Ms. Baker, if you could uh, pull your mic a little bit closer, if possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you here today. I just want to share very briefly a little bit about the Lung Association formed 115 years ago. We are the leading organization working to save lives by uh, preventing lung disease and promoting lung health. Initially, our focus was on uh, tuberculosis and eliminating tuberculosis. Today, much of our work focuses specifically on lung cancer. Yesterday, the American Lung Association released its fifth annual State of Lung Cancer Report, which sadly again finds that Kentucky ranks number one in the nation for both lung cancer incidence and lung cancer mortality. What you may not have known before today is that that's least, at least in part due to Kentuckians' exposure to radioactive radon. So just a little bit about what is radon, where does it come from, and what do we do about it? It's an invisible, naturally occurring radioactive gas found in homes and, as Kyle said, other buildings throughout the state and across the country. You cannot see it, smell it, or taste it, but it's there. It, um, it causes lung cancer, and it's present, I can tell you at the outset, in every member of this committee's area of residence or in a community that you represent, putting your families, your friends, 
and your constituents' health at risk. Most people know that smoking is the number one leading cause of lung cancer, but most people don't know that radon is the number two leading cause of lung cancer, and it is the leading cause of lung cancer among people who have never smoked. So where does it come from? It begins with the radioactive decay of uranium, which is a metal found in the rocks and the soil in places all across the United States. The decay of uranium begins a long chain, and eventually uranium turns into radium. And when radium decays, it turns into radon. And this invisible gas then finds its way out of the rocks and the soil and into the air. It's coming out of the ground pretty much everywhere, and sometimes there's a house or a building in its way as it escapes, and it gets trapped inside the air that we breathe, especially as we build homes and buildings that are more tight and energy efficient. So over 30 years ago, the U.S. Surgeon General issued the first statement advising people across the country to test their homes. Since then, We've developed a reasonably clear picture of the approximate size of the problem. EPA warns that radon is responsible for about 21,000 lung cancer deaths every year. As you know, lung cancer is easily, far and away, uh, the number one cause of cancer mortality in the United States. But if considered separately, Radon-induced lung cancer alone has a mortality rate comparable to that of other cancers that we routinely take very seriously, like leukemia and prostate cancer. Like other things, radon can be measured. Uh, The U.S. EPA's action level is four picocuries per liter of air. That means that EPA urges you to fix the problem in your homes and other buildings that have levels at four picocuries um, uh, uh, per liter of air or higher. So let's, um, let's see how radon adds to the risk of developing lung cancer first Let's look at the increased risk for lung cancer mortality from radon for people who live with the average indoor radon level in the U.S. The blue column shows what the approximate risk of dying from lung cancer would be for people if there was no radon. And as you can see, the lifetime risk for current smokers is close to 10%, whereas for lifelong never smokers, it's um, closer to 1%. The... Oh, gosh, something just went horribly wrong there. Sorry about that. Technical difficulty, and maybe I shouldn't have insisted on driving the car over here. So this chart shows the additional risk people experience when their average radon exposure is right at the EPA action level of four picocuries per liter of air. And for never smokers, radon um, adds around a half of 1%, but for current smokers, radon adds about 6% to their risk of developing lung cancer. And that's just at the action level. Here in Kentucky, the mean level is even higher at 5.4 picocuries per liter of air, and we have the second highest smoking rate in the country. So radon decays in the air, and it creates offspring, or I guess technically progeny, and when we breathe, the decay becomes lodged in our lungs, but our lungs don't have time to clear that out before more decay happens, and this releases small particles called alpha particles that then slam into the living tissue in our lungs, and these alpha particles damage the tissue and cause lung cancer, and importantly, the longer the period of exposure and the higher the level of radon, the greater the risk of developing lung cancer. Radon levels can vary significantly from one house to the next. Anything is possible, and the only way to know if it's there is to test for it. There are a variety of options for testing, beginning with like a short-term screening test, and these tests usually require only two to seven days to collect radon exposure in your home. And then you mail the test into the lab. The lab analyzes and returns the results to you. And and getting a test is is reasonably easy and costs around $15 to $20. You can order them online. You can um, 
actually even order them from the American Lung Association website, or you can purchase them in places like hardware stores in your own local communities. Professional radon testing is recommended, and um, it usually can be completed in as little as 48 hours for somewhere between $100 to $250. And this can be especially important during the real estate transaction. So if you're buying or selling a home, you should arrange for testing to be done, um, typically in the lowest livable level of the house. It doesn't matter what the uh, structure of the house is, and it should always be done by a certified professional. In fact, prior to installing a mitigation system, even if you've done do-it-yourself testing, um, that should be, your results should be confirmed by a certified professional. And when buying a new home, a newly constructed home, you should ask about radon resistant features that are already built into new home construction. Since uh, radon's a problem that affects so many people, EPA created a national map to identify areas of the U.S. with the potential for elevated indoor radon levels. So you see red zone one, greater than four picocuries, orange zone two, between two and four picocuries, and yellow zone three, less than uh, two picocuries. And if you can zoom in a little bit on Kentucky, you can see that much of the state, almost all of the state, in fact, is either red or orange. Because it's a gas, it finds its way into our homes in a variety of ways. Any place your home comes into contact with the rocks and the soil under and around it creates potential for radon to enter, most commonly through pathways like crawl spaces and sump pits and joints and cracks in the foundation and porous hollow concrete walls or even drains and, and openings for uh, utility service lines. When elevated radon levels are found, homes should be fixed with a good mitigation system, again, installed by a certified professional, and professionals, in fact, are required to be certified here in Kentucky. The, the costs are really much less than most people anticipate, ranging somewhere between $1,300 and $2,500, similar to any other home repair you might uh, need to do. So I'm going to wrap up by bringing this all home. Here in Kentucky, more than one in three homes may have dangerous levels of radon, and elevated levels of radon have been found in every one of our 120 counties across the state. So the conversation around awareness and education and ultimately policy is not more relevant anywhere else in the country than it is here in the Commonwealth. And I'll, I'll emphasize that so far we have focused primarily on our homes, but I encourage you to think about other buildings such as schools and daycare centers where caregivers and teachers and our children spend the majority of their time five days a week, year after year, potentially exposed to radioactive radon. And so now I'm going to turn things to my, my friend and my colleague here, Lindy Campbell, to share with you why that conversation around policy is not only important, but it is urgent. Lindy? Thank you. Uh, thank you for each of you giving me this time to talk today. I will have been diagnosed with lung cancer five years ago, December 6th. And uh, if you know the statistics of lung cancer, the five-year statistics are very poor. So most of the people wouldn't make it for these five years to get here today to talk to you all. So I'm thankful for this opportunity and um, I'm gonna be respectful of our time because I could talk for two days on this subject. So I've written down what I'm gonna say today and um, next slide. I've lived in Kentucky my entire life. I didn't pay attention to lung cancer because I didn't know I could ever get it if I never smoked. No one goes looking for information about lung cancer until they're diagnosed. When I was diagnosed in December of 2017, I knew it was time to start learning all I could about what now had become my disease. And I didn't have to look very far to learn that at the time of my diagnosis, as Shannon said, Kentucky ranked number one for lung cancer cases and deaths. I learned we're often referred to as the triple crown state for lung cancer because of our high levels of smoking, secondhand smoke, and radon. 
I learned that radon is the number one cause of lung cancer in never smokers. And even though some of my own doctors tried to say all along that the nodule in my lung was most likely nothing to be concerned about because I'd never smoked, I learned that as many as 20% of patients diagnosed have never smoked. That led me to ask the question why. Why did I not know people could be diagnosed with lung cancer and die from it for reasons other than smoking? It was so upsetting to me that the state both my parents and I have lived in our entire lives, the place I've always been proud to call home, we're not making our citizens more aware of this. Were we fighting hard enough to do something about this number one ranking? In my mind, I thought no other state's gonna fight for us and no other state wants the weight of this number one ranking. It's simply up to Kentucky if we want to see things change for the better for the citizens of our great state. Next slide. I spent an entire year after I was diagnosed trying to understand as much as I could about my diagnosis. I did not know any other individuals with lung cancer. There was no one to talk to about my diagnosis except families who had lost loved ones to the disease. But one thing I started to discover was that the more that I talked about having lung cancer as a never, never smoker, the more people began sharing similar stories of others they knew who received the same surprising diagnosis and later passed away. Finally, almost exactly one year after I was diagnosed, a fellow Kentucky survivor reached out to me on social media because she was Googling about lung cancer and never smokers and came across an article that had been written about me at my cancer hospital. The story had finally begun to reach a big enough audience that other survivors began to connect. Since my friend Kathy in Hallsville, Kentucky reached out to tell me her experience with lung cancer despite having never smoked, I've met 24 other Kentuckians who have been diagnosed. The stars on this map represent individuals with advanced lung, lung cancer who have never smoked. This only represents those who I've been able to connect with. It does not account for the many other stories people are continuing to tell me about their loved ones who were diagnosed and passed away from lung cancer and had no history of smoking. Next slide. There are so many stories, so much sadness, and so much suffering that accompanies this diagnosis, but today, I'll introduce you to radon related lung cancer by telling you my story. Next. I've been active and healthy my entire life. And while the stigma of lung cancer burdens those with a history of smoking with an unfair feeling of shame and blame, that same stigma causes the medical community and unsuspecting citizens to automatically assume if they have never smoked and they look healthy, they couldn't possibly have lung cancer. We don't qualify for early detection screening and any early symptoms are often dismissed and misdiagnosed until the disease spreads to other areas of the body and requires additional testing. Okay. Because of this public misperception and limited narrow conversations around the disease, this is how I found out I had lung cancer after a nodule in my lung was watched for nearly two and a half years before the decision was ever made to remove it. Unfortunately, it only took a year and a half before the cancer returned in my other lung and biomarker testing revealed I have a lung cancer mutation that is, seen, is often seen in patients who have damaged cells in their lungs because of a history of radon exposure. This science is so new and rapidly changing that we are just beginning to understand some of these mutations associated with this other damage besides smoking. I was the baby of my family. I was the only one of two family members who have never smoked, yet I was the one diagnosed with lung cancer. I was invisible in the diagnosis process because of the stigma of the disease. I was never seen as someone who could get lung cancer. Here's a photo of my childhood home. My 86 year old mother still lives in this house we all grew up in. We would often hang out in the den in our basement watching TV. We roller skated in what we liked to call the back part of the basement. And each of us siblings, as we moved out of the house one by one, I couldn't wait until at the age of 13, I was finally able to call that bedroom mine. It wasn't until after my diagnosis that we tested the basement for radon. How could we have known of this potential danger until now since we had never heard of it? If it could cause lung cancer, surely the CDC would be talking about this on their PSAs about lung cancer, but they weren't. Surely there'd be laws to test for it before you sell a home, to test for it in childcare facilities to protect our children, to test for it in public buildings to protect unsuspecting citizens. But they aren't. There aren't. 
The long-term test results shocked our entire family. They revealed that the childhood basement we all grew up playing in and sleeping in tested at a level of 21.6 picocuries, which is a toxicity level equivalent to smoking 40 cigarettes a day. So at night, this is what I was breathing. And during the day, I was breathing in secondhand smoke in my childhood home where I should have felt the safest. Next slide. I'm a mom. I'm a sister. I'm a daughter. I'm a wife, a friend. And what happened to me could happen to you or anyone you love. Next slide. The science, the statistics, you've heard them today. And the conversations regarding the dangers of radon and the risk of getting lung cancer if exposed fall along some of the same lines of conversation we had around smoking back in the 60s. And I was alive then. I was born in 1964. I just hope it doesn't take that long to get to the point where we, we are now with smoking when it comes to this message about radon. I do all I can to advocate for this disease because it's personal. My life and my future depends on it, but I can't do it alone. Kentuckians deserve better. As I mentioned to you, it took me five years to sit right here. No one else will take up this issue to protect our citizens for us. It's our responsibility to pay attention to the science, pay attention to the statistics, pay attention to the lives that have been affected, the lives that have been lost, and the lives that have yet to be affected because of a large percentage of our community does not even know this danger exists and they can't protect themselves from breathing air that could kill them because they don't know. We're Kentuckians, we've never smoked, and we are the faces of lung cancer in your Kentucky counties. And you could take a look right there. These faces match a lot of those same stars that are the statistics you've heard about today. They're not stars on a map, they're your constituents. Thank you. Ms. Campbell, thank you for your presentation. Um, it's a legislative body we hear from a lot of different groups, but it's so much more meaningful when we hear an individual who's impacted by this specifically. So I appreciate that uh, the mission that you're on and thank you for sharing your story. It uh, certainly is an eye opener. It's been very educational, very informative. Um, thank you. One question I'd have for, our, for, for the rest of the committee is, and I guess this goes to uh, Ms. Baker, on your list of the cancer type and the statistics, we've got lung cancer, 142,000, uh, and lung cancer right on 21,000. I just wonder how you make the distinction. If someone dies of, of lung cancer, if they're a smoker, do we naturally assume that it was because of um, uh, tobacco? And the point I'm trying to make is, is the 21,000 probably could be understated? <laughs> I think it very likely is understated, and I, I heard Mr. Hoyleman down at the end catch his breath. I, Kyle, I'll turn it to you to address that statistic. It, it is understated. Uh, the the 21,000 is actually from the late 80s. The original assessment of radon um, uh, hot zones in the United States was conducted using a geological survey in less than 6,000 data points. The updated CDC data, which actually is based on real test results, over 2 million data points, would suggest that 38.6% uh, of all homes in the United States contain radon issues. And when you start to update for population, you start to take into account uh, building efficiency practices uh, I believe in looking at some of the information that that number is much greater than 30,000 at this point. And can I just say that um, after I was diagnosed, I learned that it can take five to 25 years for damaged cells in the lungs to turn into cancer. And the science is so new. And um, so many of the people, my mom's 86 years old, so she lives still in the, the house that I grew up in. Uh, someone else mentioned that they grew up in a home with a basement. Most people don't have a way to trace back that far to see where their exposure was. And they die before they have a chance to be like me, to really advocate 
for this disease in never smokers or people who quit years ago. The rest of my family doesn't think about lung cancer either, sure. either because they don't qualify for testing. Mm -hmm. So you got to keep in mind that most people are just left scratching their heads, their loved one dies, and the conversation dies out. So we never really. Um, and again, that's why I'm here to talk on their behalf because they never had a chance to fight for themselves or their loved ones. Thank you. Representative McCool. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the uh, presentation. Certainly it's enlightening. Uh, appreciate your passion for this. And, and I don't know very, uh, very much about it other than what you provided to us today. So uh, by reading the material and hearing you speak, I mean, it, it appeared to me that, and I may be wrong, that it's more uh, radar is more prevalent in those who have basements, and that and if that's the case, that's you know that's fine. But if it's not, probably need to know that too because it could be everywhere. Because you mentioned schools, and I don't know if all of them have schools. And the other thing comes to my mind: okay, if we, we've got this issue, so how many uh, certified radar inspectors do we have in Kentucky? I don't know of one. Maybe you do, and if you do, that's I hope you'll share that. And how does someone become certified? Do we have a shortage of that? to detect, you know, okay, we've got a problem, how do we attack it, how do we fix it, how do we get beyond it? To recognize it's one thing, so how do we fix it? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So if I may, Representative McCool, I'll, I'll take that first question, then I'll turn it to the others at the table to answer some of your other questions. The type of construction, the type of home construction does not matter. Every home has the potential of having radioactive radon enter through cracks in the foundation or any of the other crawl spaces opportunities that I mentioned earlier. It's commonly thought a misperception that a house has to have a basement, but that absolutely is not true. Every home should be tested for radon. Kyle, did you want to talk about the number of inspectors in the state? Sure, and I'll just add on to, to Shannon's comment. There, there are three uh, conditions that you must have in order to have a, a radon problem. Uh, number one, you have to have a source. Number two, you have to have a pathway into the building. And it doesn't really matter what the foundation type is, whether it's a basement or a crawl space. It's is there a pathway into the building. And the final component would be a driving force, whether that's a mechanical uh, stack effect. Uh, here it's prevalent that it would be the thermal stack effect. So on a day like today, uh, the house is actually inhaling, and the in, in, uh, what it's inhaling is the soil gas and the moisture and the other things under, underneath the home because it's warmer inside than it is outside. Um, so the only, um, the only structure that, that would not have a uh, potential for a radon issue would be a treehouse. Um, everything else is, is fair game. Uh, in regard to the number of uh, certified professionals in the state, uh, I, I'm estimating uh, that there are two EPA-recognized proficiency programs, and we didn't want to create a, a big bureaucracy uh, here at the state level. So instead, what we've done is we've just acknowledged that those proficiency programs are sufficient. Uh, they are operated and maintained under EPA's guidance. Uh, and so here in Kentucky and surrounding states, uh, we have in excess of 400 qualified professionals to do the work. Uh, and that's, you know, so we're we're well suited uh, to, to take on this work, and a lot of this work is done. Uh, it's, I, I estimate somewhere around 15% of our real estate transactions already um, are, are having the home tested. But if you go to the 10 to 15% that we see here in Kentucky, and you go to states with mature laws such as Minnesota or Illinois, voluntary laws, 65 to 70% of the homes are tested as part of the real estate transaction. So it's basically empowering consumers to make an informed decision. And unfortunately, they just don't have the, the, the information to make that decision. And we see that, that happening in, in other states. And I think the final question, um, uh, Representative McCool, was what's the process? Uh, so the process, there, there's really three components to the industry per se. There's uh, the measurement or characterizing uh, to, to determine if the building does have a problem. That's a cry. That's a, a certification. There's mitigation or mitigating the occupant exposure. So, 
Uh, there's remediation and mitigation in, in the environmental world. Uh, remediation is removal of the source, and mitigation is just mitigating exposure to the source. Uh, we're obviously not able to remediate radon uh, because of the uranium and, and, and whatnot. So it's mitigation. And the way that we do that, uh, think of it as a glorified vacuum system between the sub-foundation of the building and the building. So we change the pressure differential of the building uh, so that you're not being exposed to radon uh, or any other soil contaminant for that that matter uh, and we vent outside where within two to four feet uh, the radon dilutes safely to outdoor concentration which around here is about 0 0.4 thank you take your chair excellent questions representative cool appreciate that senator kerr Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a question for Ms. Campbell, if you could answer and or if you feel comfortable answering. Sure. Uh, how did you know to go get your lungs checked? Uh, were you having symptoms? Were you, was this part of just a baseline for something else? Well, that question is why I told you I could probably be up here for two days telling you about it, and I'm glad you asked. Um, I was just having symptoms of acid reflux. They were unrelated to the lung cancer. Um, but I did have a really good primary care physician, and that's another thing I advocate for, like especially as women, like don't rely on your GYN. Like, you know, and she knew me well enough, and she just – ran a check stack tray too because I was in my early 50s and looking at my heart and that that showed a very small shadow but I like to make it clear the only reason it showed up is because it was so early so that image is really dense and actually shows up on an x-ray a CT scan is the only way to truly determine lung cancer however most of the people I meet they have a call that I didn't have symptoms of lung cancer it take it took a long time so they have other symptoms like they're coughing or they have they take an x-ray it looks like pneumonia and they don't, they're not seen as somebody, so it's treated that way for a long time, which is what I discussed when I talked about that. So she, she referred me to a pulmonologist who did the CT scan. That is where I got stuck in the system for two and a half years. Even while they, they monitored it, our friend actually was the radiologist who told us, keep looking at this, it could be lung cancer, thank goodness. But that radiologist, n not really a fault of him, I don't mention his name, because that's what we're stuck in right now. He just kept, and I said, even though I grew up around secondhand smoke and radon, yep, nope, the percentages are so small. And we finally had to get a second and third opinion before I could get the surgery to have the nodule removed, mm -hmm. which is why that's when I woke up to the news. And even, and so early symptoms, there's no pain sensors in the lungs. So we often have to find it another way. I have one uh, girl from Elizabethtown, she actually had a stroke because her uh, her initial nodule was near her heart. Uh, another girl just told me that she had neurological symptoms because she had already had meds to the brain. And we're talking about, I've known some people that get stuck in the medical system for up to 18 months because they don't look like somebody who could get lung cancer. And that's it. I don't look like, I, what does lung cancer look like? We've defined it far too long by what we've been taught that it looks like and again that feeds the stigma that's so unfair you know uh, my whole family smoked it doesn't matter if they had gotten lung cancer i'd have been just as devastated or as passionate but you know it's, it's really educating the population that's not being heard or protected so that's where my voice came in but yeah mine just was found incidentally that's why i'm sitting here today but everybody you saw on that screen and most people i meet found their lung cancer after it already spread to other other parts of their body and so i've lost several friends actually in that picture you saw my 32 year old friend elizabeth who lives in jefferson county she just passed away um a, a woman from uh, prestonsburg a, a cattle farmer she she lost her life two years after her diagnosis she just turned 40. i could tell you stories over and over again every one of these people i would tell you their story western kentucky i'm sorry if there's anybody here my husband grew up in bowling green we have a lot of people we know in Western Kentucky that would really like to know what's in those cave systems. Uh, so, you know, all that's for another day, but I just hope this has ignited uh, some thoughts in your head today because um, I got a lot more I could say. Well, hopefully you'll be Thank called you. on to say that uh, Thank to other you. committees. I Thank you, Mr. It. Chairman. Thank you. And an excellent presentation. Uh, I think you've opened up a lot of eyes this morning. I'm sure we're going to have continued discussion about this, and I appreciate the mission that you're on 
please know that we are supported. Well, thank you. you. Please remember, it took me five years to get here. We don't mm. have five years. My friends in those mm. pictures, they don't have five years. Do they don't. Noted. Appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next presentation, and just remind the committee, we've got two more agenda items, but just one presentation. This will be our last presentation. This is on um, temporary elevator mechanic license, discussion of House Bill 249. If representatives are here, please come forward and identify you for yourself for the record, and let's proceed. Ryan Underwood, I uh, represent DC Elevators on a government affairs level. I'm sorry. Yeah, would you please try that again? I don't believe your mic was on. Sorry, Brian Crispin. Um, I'm uh, one of the parties this is this whole discussion is about. Ronnie Bentley, I'm the vice president of service at, at DC Elevator. Glad to have you here this morning. And Ryan, I assume you're going to kick this off. I, I am. Um, I'm just going to give a, a brief background. Uh, last year, we worked on House Bill 249 uh, via a Senate committee substitute to kind of put some more guardrails up and, and ultimately expand uh, temporary elevator mechanics licensure um, and, and gave it some broader definitions. But we were obviously dealing with a labor shortage issue. Um, so we, we expanded the language, and I'm happy to go into that later. I want these gentlemen to tell their story, um, specifically to allow veterans uh, access to temporary elevator mechanic licensure with a number of, of other specifications in there. But I will let uh, Ronnie really tell you how this has worked out. Well, we've had issues trying to get uh, Mr. Crispin licensed. He is a veteran. Uh, he worked on uh, medical equipment. He was trained on medical equipment for the last... 15 years or so you've been working on helicopters for the EMS uh, according to what the statute says that uh, the background should be equivalent and we've been held to exact and there is no exact elevator industry in the military there is no exact elevator training in the military um, so we have uh, requested temporary license for Mr. Crispin and it has been denied on multiple occasions I don't know how far to go with it well <laughs> there there have also been a number of other uh, denials from for DC elevators you all put forth probably a half dozen at this point different. yes last year in December uh, we had put forth a it was the reason for the legislation change or, or for the wording change we had tried to get a uh, temporary license for a mechanic that had all the qualifications mm -hmm. that previously in the past five, ten years, we'd had no problems getting. I received an email back from a, a person at the licensing division saying that uh, the wording of the legislation says there has to be a need. So I called them and I said, we have a need. And they said, no, you don't. There's mechanics on the bench. I said, we're a merit shop. We don't have a bench. And they told, I was told it's not my problem. So we have we didn't want to come here. I didn't want to be here. I didn't want to bother y'all today. But we have no choice. We can't, our business can't continue to grow without help. Yeah. So to give you some specifics, and I've got the language in front of me, but we, we changed it to a shortage of licensed personnel available. Um, and that would, is due to a reduction of licensed elevator mechanics employed by the contractor uh, or an increase in work. I want to noted that we worked specifically with the elevator mechanics union on this to craft this language. Everybody had a seat at the table when we did this. There were conversations. We worked on every word of this with all stakeholders. And and there really was no major conflict. We, we got this worked out, took it in front of uh, Chairman Schickel's committee, um, and, it, and it moved on from there. Um, the idea, you know, specifically it's to, to get a temporary license, it's a state certified apprenticeship program uh, training program provided by the National Elevator Industry Educational Program or the National Association of Elevator Contractors. And this is where we're seeming to have the issue is equivalent experience while ser serving in the United States military to perform elevator work without direct and immediate supervision, uh, not to exceed 25% of the number of licensed personnel employed by the elevator contractor. Um, they're, they're taking, I feel like, when we're looking at licensure, they're taking the word equivalent 
to uh, Mr. Bentley's point, to mean exact. There is no elevator training in the United States military in any branch. Um, and that seems to, to currently be our issue. Um, but, yeah, it's, we're happy to take any questions uh, along the way. Well, you know, in all probability, at least on the Senate side, this will go back to licensing regulation, occupation regulations. Uh, um, and it appears that once you're asking for some clarification uh, of the language or maybe mm -hmm. some um, uh, additional language. Ultimately, that's going to be the ask is we're going to have to take this back and, mm -hmm. and tweak the language some more, mm -hmm. um, you know, to I think to to get it to your point, some some mm -hmm. clarification on this. Um, all right. 78. So. Thank you. Just. Just in a total, you know, obviously public safety is obviously number one priority. Mm -hmm. So we would ever want to do anything to, to hurt that, and I'm sure neither would you. Correct. Um, part of that would be the liability that, that you put on there, too. That's how we do these checks and balances. Sure. Um, but whenever we do, because if you, a veteran, had been trained in something that was very similar, then I would look at that. That's experience. That's training. That would be a similar form of education and exactly. would otherwise protect that industry. Um if you're saying there isn't someone then the training that's very similar well then you would not have that training education and experience so if it's to me and i'm going to show my ignorance but the difference between working on medical equipment and an elevator would seem very very different um if if somehow you could show that, that it's the same type of base training and education experience that would provide that level of safety then that'd be something different so i know that the language will be tweaked onto it but to me whenever I look at any kind of apprenticeship programs or license or anything like that, I want to make sure that when my family is involved in, and whether it's a, a railing on somewhere or an elevator or escalator or whatever that is, that anyone working on there has, has all those credentials. And that's what I think whenever I travel to other places, whenever, um, you know, I, I see that individuals didn't go through apprenticeship program, thing like that, I know that my family's a little bit less safe. And I think the biggest part of this, body we want to make sure that we have those checks and balances put in place i think that may be the intention and i i can see ryan wanting yeah. to jump in here really bad um but I, but I, I do want to say like anytime we look at not just this particular piece um i know during covid and with shortage whether it was cdls or everything else we keep bringing that standard down um, because we need we, there's a need there but what i worry about is what what type of um what some families are going to suffer because of that, because I do believe in professionalism mm -hmm. and training, making sure you do have all the certifications because that's what makes us great. Um, but I watch whether it's all these different professions in the past few years, because we have a workforce problem and instead of increasing pay to draw more people in to, to, to encourage them to get the additional degrees and the training, what we're doing is we're reducing down what the certifications are. Um, just so more people can come into the market. And can to I, me, I, I hope that that won't be a public issue, a public safety issue. And you can address this directly if, if you like to, but sure. I just want to put that out there. Could I address that? Like, um, so specifically, um, so elevators, there's electric, electronic controls. Um, essentially, I've gone and done a, a level of training that's beyond and above other than one guy who actually is an electrical engineer who works for the company. Um, my level of training is above and beyond what you would see uh, from that. And so I, I agree with you, yes, absolutely. But you know, in this particular instance, and for my level of training, um, I think it's not really a level of, of training um, that is what's the issue here. It's just how do we, is it defined well enough? And also um, a lack of, uh, will perhaps would be a tactful way to say it um, to to sign off on people coming into the trade. Well, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. You also have 15 years of experience working on uh, helicopters as a mechanic as well. Yeah. So you make a mistake, people die. I've been in that um, you know profession and uh, know the stakes and uh, you know what it demands. And, and the reason that we we did this, and, and I'm happy to, to show you the language because we put some very real guardrails up around this as well, um, is was for elevator contractors to have the capacity to get these mechanics, these temporary licenses to do maintenance specifically. I mean, really, that is that is the goal um, to free up their 
you know, permanently licensed workers to go do installations and a little bit more of the heavy lifting, as it were. So um, that's kind of where we are with this. And it is the it's really the equivalent experience language in this that seems to have, again, caused the problem here. And we were also told by the licensing department that they didn't recognize our nationally recognized apprenticeship programs have been approved through the state also. Thank you for that. Uh, Representative Duplessis. Uh, my line of questioning is similar to the senators just now. And uh, so he and I were on kind of a similar page. And I, I think what you said, if you make mistakes, people die, is, is the whole reason that there's probably concern, at least on my part here. Sure. Um, a, a helicopter mechanic proves somebody's an excellent mechanic and it doesn't prove they're an excellent understander of all different systems. For instance, a guy who's really good at fixing cars is probably a really good mechanic and he knows a Chevy 350 and every little thing that might go wrong in that engine and can fix it a lot quicker than somebody like me who would have to really work at it. But with an elevator, you you have num numbers and numbers and numbers of safety switches, uh, safety relays, red eyes looking for for things to be lined up right there's a lot of different safeties involved with it with an elevator so i think i'm okay with what what we're talking about making sure we can have good mechanics working on in elevators and and, and grease that path if you will to make that happen but not without making sure that that mechanic truly understands the safeties that are involved with that elevator just like we wouldn't want a great elevator mechanic to go work on a helicopter even though he could do that, or she could do that with some training. There's a lot of mistakes that can be made simply for the lack of experience of knowing those systems. And when you make mistake, mistakes, people die. Um, and that can happen in an elevator. So I would want to make sure that whatever uh, thing that we did to help get good mechanics into the elevator <clears throat> programs, if you will, certifications. So, so part of this, part of the language that we that made we sure that the safeties were covered. Yeah. Part of the language that we added to this as well is that a minimum of 24 months of documented experience. So let's say you've got somebody like Brian that went to work for DC Elevators with all his experience would need to be there kind of as an assistant or apprentice for two years before this could even be brought up to licensure. Like, but is there no, is there no testing involved? Is there no? Sure, we're still part of the test, and he stays in the in the apprenticeship program. Okay, so there's but still it's like be testing. having a, a a PhD come down and proofread your paperwork. I mean, he's been at a much higher level than any of the elevator trade is. And I know you, it's not exactly the same, but it says equal. It doesn't say it has to be exact because there is no exact in the military elevator trade. Yeah. But he, he is much more qualified than any elevator man that, that we've had working for us in the 18 years that I've been there. Yeah. I would just like to have some way to certify that we know. It's not just somebody telling us he's a great mechanic that he's passed some kind of certification proving that. Well, there there are actually tests. Like, part of being in the apprenticeship program, there's tests that I've gone through, and, like, there's a um, the two-year bypass. I don't, Ronnie can speak more in detail because I don't know the organizational side of that, you know. But before, you know, we really walked very far down this road or before I even was um, – up to eligible to put in for the bypass i had to get past that test and i had been following and shadowing in senior mechanics um so it's not like they grabbed me off the street and they're like hey here's an elevator you know um nothing to that sort um there's definitely uh steps that we that are being taken to walk through and quality control if you will Okay. There's a program that he's in. It's called the CET. It's the Certified Elevator Technician Program. It's ran through the NAEC, which is the National Association of Elevator Contractors. With his experience and his background, he was allowed to test up to a two-year point, which is at what point you'd get a temporary license from the NAEC. He exceeded all those expectations and passed all those tests. So that would prove that he is he's capable of working on elevators, understanding the uh, basics and the under the uh, the safety features of the elevator, and and on the the actual application, there is an area where you have to extensively fill out you know what your specific military experience is, is because the HBC has a lot of discretion here. Obviously, they've proven that um, on 
on who they will issue a temporary license to or not. So, so it's not. Is it just the elevator union, mechanics union, that's kind of trying to push the stop? We don't have this? a problem with no. It. We and again, we worked with them last okay. year on on this language specifically. Um, okay. It uh, the the folk. It's housing building and construction that has this in their purview as far as issuing the license. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Obviously, uh, the, you're here today because the ambiguity of the, the language in the original bill, and um, uh, that's something someone's going to have to address. I'm not sure it's going to be the purview of this committee or not. Again, could be a licensing and go back there, but appreciate you making them aware of this. Um, you know, I learned very early on in my Senate career uh, that uh, every bill we pass has unintended consequences, and uh, uh, could be the reason we come back in 30 days of uh, sessions and to try to fix those things. But appreciate you bringing this matter to our attention and uh, I'll probably have some conversations with uh, the chairs of these other committees as well. But appreciate you being here today and wish you the best going forward. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Last item we have before us is numerous uh, regulations for review. Does anyone have any concerns, comments, questions about any of those? Uh, we do have uh, folks here to um, answer questions if need be, but if there are no questions, comments, or concerns, then uh, we'll assume everything's okay. Looks like everything's okay. Let me by finish by uh, recognizing uh, Representative Duplessy. Uh, he wasn't here earlier when we recognized the other members who are leaving, but uh, Representative, we certainly appreciate your contributions to this committee. Uh, uh, you know, particularly Hardin County and his relationship with Fort Knox, uh, your word has been invaluable to this committee, and we wish you the best going forward and appreciate your contribution, not just state, but to your home community and uh, the Commonwealth as a whole, and uh, you, you, you will be missed. Any uh, final parting comments for us, uh, Jim? <laughs> I'm going to miss you guys, but it's it's been a fun ride, and I know we're we're in good hands, so I'm I'm okay with it, so. I'll be watching. We wish you the best uh, going forward. Any other comments, concerns? If not, we'll finish with want to bless uh, everybody with that wonderful Thanksgiving holiday ahead, holiday season ahead, and um, this is our last meeting during the interim. So, again, thank everyone for your contribution. And